5 today is going to a place that needs no introduction. Most of us know one or two things about Nsunwe. But I promise you, there is something that you didn't know about this place. And that is what Cruise 5 is going to find out. So stick around as we go and unearth something you didn't know about Nsunwe. Welcome to Child Legacy Community Hospital. This hospital is found here in Nsundwe. We are here to meet the founder of Child Legacy International, Jeff Rogers. There's more to Child Legacy International than just this community hospital. So we're going to find out more about this hospital and many other things that fall under Child Legacy International. In a moment, we meet the founder of Child Legacy International. Jeff Rogers, welcome to Cruise 5. Thank you very much. You're up. Good and, to be here. Um, thank you so much for welcoming us to Child Legacy International Community Hospital. I don't know what to call this place. It's quite <laughs> overwhelming. It's quite overwhelming. Coming here, you don't know that you're going to find something like this. This is a very, very fantastic place. It's very diversified. It yes. really is. Primary focus, of course, is health care. Yeah. And then we do a lot of other programs that feed into that health care program. Great. So you could spend a couple of days here and still not see it all. I'm looking forward to that. But for now, we just have to uh, spend a couple of uh, hours here. Uh, but we still have to learn as much as we can about this place. But before we get to that, let's get more uh, to know more about you. Um, I just know you're American. Yeah. Um, where exactly were you born? Oh, I was born outside Chicago. Okay. And I grew up in the state of Indiana. All right. And um, whenever I go back to the States... Uh, I reside in Texas. Okay. But to be honest with you, I spend probably eight, nine, ten months out of the year right here. I see. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I see you've been to all kinds of places. Um, I, I know you've been to Zimbabwe. Yes. And now you're here in Malawi. Yes. And I mean, you're based in Malawi now. That's right. Uh, but before you go to do all these kind of things, what exactly did you do? I mean, uh, <laughs> who is Jeff? What have you been up to? You've done all kinds of things, I understand. You know, foundationally in my life, um, I was one of those young men that was left with um, sort of a scar in my life that I would never amount to much. Okay. Um, I had been in several accidents that had um, should have taken my life. Is uh, it? I was in. A, I had rheumatic fever when I was young and was actually died. And um, healthcare isn't what it is now and um, so but you know they were able to bring me back and but the high temperatures that I had really scarred I uh, I mean I cooked with 104 temperature Jesus where Christ. my eyes fell back and uh, hair fell out teeth went black and uh, actually my brain and heart were scarred from having this fever for so long and then went through an explosion that buried me uh, under concrete for a long time and busted me up uh, back was broken hip was fractured half of my chest was was crushed and with these handicaps I was just always told you know you just you won't never be much too much 
And to be honest with you, I ended up just being a truck driver. Um, but I had a company, a construction company, because I love building. I, I, I love developing things. And I remember, and I'll make this as Reader's Digest version as I can, I remember turning in the side of my truck and just kind of looking up to God and saying, man, if this is all there is, why? Because, you know, I didn't choose to have all these problems. And, um, boy, it just felt like there was something out there, but I had to go grab it. So I traveled to Haiti, Dominican Republic, Kenya, and I was building clinics and felt like I was contributing back, trying to help the best I can. Went to Zimbabwe in 1983, was helping to build a clinic, and I never left. I stayed there. And I was there for 20 years and developed a huge vocational school, which is now the second largest in southeast Zimbabwe. We've graduated over uh, 10, 12,000 through the formal sector, and 80% of them have a job today. Wow. And that means a lot in developing countries. Yes. We developed a healthcare program in Zimbabwe. Uh, we were running the largest feeding program in Zimbabwe for five years where we fed 66,000 kids, and we did that for five years during the drought. Um, took all those best practices in Zimbabwe. We came to Malawi in 2006. Mm -hmm. And I wanted this to be the model. I wanted this to be the project that could be duplicated in part or as a whole, that could make a real difference, not only in a, a developing nation like Malawi, but anywhere where healthcare was challenged, education was challenged. And so let me just say for a young man that was constantly told he may not make much, well, when you show the picture of the overview of this project, it, this project has changed lives. It's mind blowing. Yeah. It's mind blowing. What, what kept you going? What kind of inspiration did you have? Mm. All the odds were stuck against you, but something must have said, push on because I mean yeah. most of uh, most people would give up at that point and and you know giving up is the easy thing to do it is it really it's the is. easy way out um, and sometimes when you have had some accomplishments in your life and you realize gosh it's just been too tough yeah. nobody's gonna blame you yeah you know you want to pack up and go back to America you know they say man we understand you see that's not good enough and it's when people say to you you can't do that and that's what lights the fire under you. Uh -huh. It's when somebody says to you, it can't be done. You don't have the education to do that. You don't have the skill set to do that. You're not qualified to do that. Uh -huh. And I just look into my little cheat sheet book, my history book, and yeah. I go, you're right. And I can't. But there is a higher power that says, I can. Uh -huh. And watch me. And that's when you just kind of dig in. And you don't let go. And you know that... You know, a seaman can only be graded by the last storm he successfully navigated. And people that have never had to navigate a storm really don't have any experience about anything to talk about. But when you've navigated storms, sometimes multiple storms, you're the captain that people want to put in their ships. You're the pilot that they want to put in that new plane up there. You don't want to get in an airplane and find out the pilot's only got 10 hours of flying. But when he's navigated multiple storms, you can sit back in that plane and go, I'm okay. I'm, I'm in a, hands. Yeah. And then you know you're going to get there. This area of Malawi, and this is one of the poorest areas of Malawi right here. This area right here is like health care. We just didn't really have any health care. Education, we have a small primary school. We've been very involved with developing that as well. And it was like, who's going to be the person that's going to hang on and make a difference? Here we are. Here we are, and here we are talking to Jeff Rogers, co-founder of Child Legacy International. And uh, we're right here. This is a big establishment, and that's what we want to unpack today. But we also want to unpack music. Um, I don't know. Do, do, do you like music at all? <laughs> do you find time to listen to music? And sometimes you get too busy, and you can't even find time to listen it's to It's not hard to become too busy, but yes, I do. <laughs> I, I can enjoy. Don't ask me to dance. I will that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Are you the kind that have two left feet? <laughs> I don't think I have any feet when it comes to dancing. 
<laughs> Let's go to our first song on Cruise 5 today. What is it going to be? Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Some of that good holy, blue jazz. Holy, holy. That's yes. some fantastic country and western music. Well, it is for me. Yes. <laughs> it Great. Is for me. And that's going to be our first song on Cruise 5 today with our guest, Jeff Rogers. Neil Diamond. Holly, holly, holly. Doesn't look like you did quite a lot of education. You didn't even have time to do that because I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, Shadi, but you you were busy nursing one injury after another. And, well, uh, when 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 your when your brain gets scarred with the kind of temperatures I had, yes, learning's not easy. Yes, and uh, the only thing I became really good at was cheating in school. <laughs> and so the, and I look, everybody's going to laugh and I go, you're kidding me. We've invested into this man and he's telling us. <laughs> he was a genital. I you, had to become good at that. Yes. So you, that you, I you could get through. Survive. So I could get through. <laughs> and uh, finally graduating from high school. And I got to tell you, graduating from high school was a tough chore for me. Yes. But put me into the field and say, we need to develop this or build this. Yeah. You got my attention now. Yes. Because I, I think the ca different kinds of intelligence, there's the academic type that is very good at getting all the good grades and, you know, you get all the certificates and degrees. But then there are some who are artists, that's mm. some kind of intelligence as well. And then there, is, there are people like you who are just good at conceiving ideas and then getting down to the ground and, and, and doing it. And it looks like you, you've done quite a great job at that. Well, you know, ideas are easy. Yeah. And to some degree, ideas are cheap. Yes. Now, my board of directors for Child Legacy in America, they hate it when I get an idea because it's expensive. Because I like to take an idea. I don't even like to call it, I have a dream. Yes. I want to say to you that I have an idea that I believe will be a solution to some of the problems that we face. And it's easy to recognize a problem. Matter of fact, if you look at in in Southern Africa, the amount of NGOs that we have throughout it, all of Africa, how every one of them, them can list yep. the problems, yes. but how many of them will be able to say to you, it's no good to keep moving on to the next problem unless you've come up with a solution for the first for the one. First one yes. And fundamentally, there are some key components that have to take place before you could actually develop a community or society. And health and education are two of those very important components. A community cannot develop successfully unless these components are in place, health, education, and then we work on infrastructure. And so you take this area where we're at with a catchment area that has grown to nearly 100,000 people for our hospital. So it develops now because healthcare provides them with important need that they have. Then when education starts to grow, you'll find, okay, we, let's, let's move into this area and develop. Makanga down here, the village down here, as you drove through coming in, mm -hmm. that didn't exist five years ago. There wasn't anything there. Matter of fact, the road ended at Inchepa's village, this last village you went through. And we extended that road, brought it in here, drilled a well, started to, and believe me, f uh, 14 years ago, it was nothing here. That's what I, that's not, what I, that's what I hear. Not a thing. Just well, brush. let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, I want to eat this elephant bit by bit. <laughs> what gave you the energy to leave the United States of America and start going places to say, I'm going to do this, and then the next, and then the next, and then, of course, the huge Zimbabwe project, and mm. now even a bigger Malawi project. But let's get from the beginning. What drove you to say, I'm going to do this? Well, uh, again... Uh, you, you know, it's it, it's easy to get stuck into that rut of life that says, I'm getting by. Yes. I have a job and I'm providing and I'm getting by. And you can be happy with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But it's when you get to that place in your life where getting by is not enough. You want to make a difference. Okay. So if in me is the ability to contribute something back mm -hmm. that can actually stimulate oh. Uh, in, in this case, a village, a community, uh, a culture, then why not? Why not be a part of that key component that says, let's stimulate to create. And when we do that and lives change, who knows what can come out of that? Mm -hmm. So here there was just bare ground, there was nothing here. 
And what can we create with that bare ground? There's a hospital here, there's um, staff housing, there's agriculture. Matter of fact, Malawi Medical Council has said that this is the only hospital that is 100% energy sustainable because it's all run by alternative energy. 400 solar panels, two wind turbines, everything's powered by wind and sun here. We're not on the grid. And when we started doing that, people would say, well, you can't do that. Well, that's all you need to do to light my fuse is tell me I can't do something. <laughs> we did it in Zimbabwe in the mid-90s when nobody would touch alternative energy. It was taboo. It was, and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, cost-effective yes. either. Uh, it was very expensive in the 90s to do alternative. But it wasn't hard to see because this is one of those problems. You know, 85% of Malawians live in a rural setting. Yes. 1.3 billion people on the globe do not have access to electricity. Yes. Malawi makes up part of that 1.3 billion people. So here's a problem we have. How do we get power to start to energize rural Malawi? How do we get power into classrooms, clinics, hospitals, a little retail shop, uh, a, a tea shop on the side of the road? Mm -hmm. The only way you can do that is through alternative energy because our national grid in Malawi is not capable of powering all of Malawi for 19 million people. It cannot. But we've said it can be done. And we've done it with this entire, and there's over 60,000 square feet under roof here. Total with hospitals, staff houses, guest rooms, dining area, everything under roof is powered by wind and sun. And we've said it can be done, and so we did it. So how do we approach that power? Well, this is what we do in, in that particular area. So. I think when people realize, and it's like yourself, you're, you're a creative man. Um, in order to run a successful show, you have to be able to create the ideas that says, what will stimulate my viewers? And so this, this Mzungu, this man from, from Texas in Masundwe here, can he stimulate our viewers? Well, I'll tell you what. Anybody that comes to this project and sees where it came from and where it is, if they're not stimulated, they're probably already dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, this place is enough to even stimulate a dead person <laughs> to lives. And uh, that's what we hope is going to happen by the end of this program. Um, after this next song, I want us to get into what is offered at this place because it's a lot it's a lot but i don't want us to get there until we get onto our second song which is going to be despacito yeah despacito so this one you'll have to dance to no no no, no please despacito and not dance you've got lots of volunteers <laughs> here <laughs> you know white people were never given the ability to dance we no, no, stumble no, no. that's wrong they say they can dance but they're always dancing to the next song I'll work with that. So before the second yeah. song plays, you're already dancing to it. And Despachito is going to be our next song on Cruise 5 today. That's the choice of, of our guest, Jeff Rogers, co-founder of Child Legacy International. Now, we, I keep saying co-founder, and we haven't even gotten to talking about who the other founder is, <laughs> who we haven't even spoken about on this show. Uh, let's get to know more about the co-founder. Well, um, Corrine. Yes. Um, so I met Corrine in Zimbabwe. Okay. Um, I actually was one of these guys that thought being single would allow me to do more effectively and productively. <laughs> and uh, I, I met her in, um, gosh, 1986. Mm -hmm. We were married in 1987. Mm -hmm. um, her family all come from Mauritius. They're, they're Mauritian French. Okay. And uh, my two sons were born in Zimbabwe. Uh -huh. And uh, matter of fact, one of them is a, a corporate pilot in America now who learned to fly in Africa. I see. And the other one is a personal fitness trainer. Uh -huh. And um, I have a granddaughter now, so they're all back in, in America. Okay. And uh, of course, with this pandemic, people couldn't move around. So, yes. um, so she was a major part of what was developed in Zimbabwe and, and what you see here as well. All right. Uh, she defines things better than I do. <laughs> Is it? You know, I can build a building and I'll lay it out and do everything, but when it comes to 
curtains and colors and this and that. I miss it just a bit. She's, she's, the, she's the brand behind that. But there, well, don't say that too loud. <laughs> we don't want anybody to know she's that. She's got to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> but she's not here now, now is No, she? no, no. She's in the United States. Okay. And uh, because of our new granddaughter and, and everything. Um, and then when, again, the pandemic and airports closed down, All nobody. Right. So but you guys are still together. I'm here and she's there. And uh, well, w th there's been challenges yes. in a in a project like this. Okay, fine. Um, I'm one of these guys, and I'll just come right out and say it. I'm a workaholic. <laughs> I thought about that, but I didn't want to say it until you said it. Yeah, sun up, sun down, and and the, and the thing about it is, a project of this nature demands a lot of resources. Yes. And this project is, for the most part, funded from uh, a donor base in the United States. Uh -huh. And because they're seven, eight hours behind us, I have to start to work at six, seven at night with them, my office in America and with donors. So I'll start work here at six in the morning mm -hmm. and then I'll work with America till 11, 12 o'clock at night yeah. and then try to get a little sleep in between. Yeah. And I have to do that on an ongoing, because if I don't keep the fuel coming into this project, yeah. hospital has a huge appetite, a huge appetite. A yeah. So, you know, because I, I I don't know how to switch off. Um, it puts a real strain on a relationship. I can imagine yeah, that. Yeah, it does. I can imagine that. Yeah. There's always a price to pay for uh, setting up a structure and an institution uh, of this size and keeping it running. Mm -hmm. uh, which brings me to the next question. After doing so much in Zimbabwe, you still felt, let's go to Malawi and start. What, 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 what brought about that uh, movement? You know, um, in the late 90s, I had traveled to Malawi okay. um, a couple of times from Zimbabwe to do some leadership training. Right. Um, I, I've been a part of uh, businessmen leadership um, and accountability businessmen leadership. I'd, I've done it in America and I was doing it in Zimbabwe and I'd come up here with some men and we were doing, and I, I looked at Malawi and I thought, wow, you know, this is a country that um, I'd really like to come and establish some of our programs. Now, I didn't think I would then. Yes. And then Zimbabwe went through some real challenging times um, in the late 90s going into early 2000. And those challenging times had a real effect on our work and what we were doing. Okay. So we thought, well, we're going to take this opportunity then to relocate. I see. Now, even though we've relocated and we are here, we still run everything in Zimbabwe. I see. The uh, vocational school still runs. The healthcare institution still runs. We have a 66-bed orphanage there, r right next to the uh, rural district health center, and which is all solarized. Mm -hmm. And um, those programs are still in place and still operating by a wonderful, wonderful woman that actually came up through the ranks of our school right into becoming the director of wow. everything that we do there. That, that's and a great story. I, I hope we'll go to Zimbabwe to talk to her and <laughs> see how that truly transformational story. Looking to go into another country? We'll, we'll... Ooh. <laughs> if I was 20 years younger, maybe I, I could do I that. that the um, energy is running out. Uh, I'm looking for the fountain of youth. Maybe I could do that. <laughs> um, this project here, the, right now, we're, we're at a tipping point with this project right here. Yeah. Um, and you know, tipping points are significant of many things. Number one, could be a success or it's simple failure so that you can move on. Okay. And now we're not at that, we're not failing here, but because a hospital like this one that really offers a free service to the community mm -hmm. uh, with that big appetite, we've put in a lot of programs that within the next couple of years, we hope and believe will generate the resources that are needed to offset the operation cost of this hospital. Okay. Because it takes a lot when you've got 90 to 100 technical staff down yes. there and you've got consumables and you've got drugs um, and you have all the, everything that is needed to run a community hospital, it takes a lot of money to do that. Mm -hmm. And most donors don't want to, you to be dependent upon them. All right. So we've put in a lot of programs here on the land that Child Legacy has here, where we've put in 20,000 bamboo plants. Um, we're gonna be planting more, but we'll have about 3,000 macadamia trees. Um, we have 16 fish ponds with over 3 million tilapia in there. Everything that we do here has to generate resources. 
that can be plowed back in to offset that hospital so that we can say to our donors, so yeah, we need, we need to develop. We want to put pediatrics in. We want to put cardio in, um, a neonatal center. Um, and we need your help to do that. But a lot of the operation cost, we're able to manufacture right here at this project. And if we can do that, we definitely will be set aside. We'll be one of the few non-government organizations that actually has a functioning project of this nature that's almost self-sustaining. Self-sustaining, yeah. and that's the key word. Looking at this place now, and looking at how it was before, before you even uh, hit the first, uh, the first nail on the, on, the, on the ground to pitch up your tent, <laughs> it looked pretty barren when you were coming here. Not a thing here. Tell me how easy or how hard it was to <laughs> find even this place. You know, <laughs> I'm told this was an abandoned place. Well, the initial piece of land that we're on, we were told by the the community this was cursed land that nobody wanted. Cursed land. Yeah, and and that's kind of hard for a foreigner like me to understand. But coming from Zimbabwe, I understood the culture of that. Yes. And so um, it was made available to us by the traditional authority and the all the group village headmen here. So um, we negotiated that deal. But I'm telling you, there was there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. Um, you know, I can't tell you exactly what David Livingston must have felt when he when he macheted through the bush. Yes. But there sure have been times I feel like I could say, I relate to that. Exactly. Because it was a challenge. I was looking at some pictures and there was just a tent yeah. and uh, a, grass, uh, a grass fence around it where you stayed for how long? Two years. Two years. Yeah. In that tiny tent. Yes. Must have been very, very hot. I mean, it's, it's almost exposed to the sun completely hot a day in december january you cooked in july you froze <laughs> <laughs> and it, when we went a year we didn't have any hot water and uh, but you know the the key to success to a large degree is hinged on your commitment which is a result of your investment i see so when we put up that tent we were trying to say to the community we're going to invest here and I'm going to live in this tent for two years. Now, I don't think I had to prove anything to them. That was not why I did it. But I also have to show myself I can do this. Yeah. So I'm going to invest into this barren, nothing here, piece of ground that's been cursed by your ancestors. Yes. And I'm going to commit to it. And the term buy-in, when we all say as NGOs we want our community to buy in, Nothing, nothing could be more correct because a community's buy-in is going to be their commitment to its success. And that's why it's so important that we always encourage our people to work, develop, build, have ideas. Don't wait for it to be handed out to you. Get up, make it happen, invest in it. That's your commitment. That will be your success. And you had asked me, you know, what made you hang on? I, I don't really just, you know, because I'm not only committed, I'm invested into this. Yes. And if I'm invested, I can guarantee you I'm committed to it. You bought a car. I, I don't, I'm sure you did. Mm -hmm. You own a car. You're making payments on a car. You paid cash for the car. I can guarantee you, you're not just going to loan those keys to just anybody. Exactly. Because you're committed to it. Yes. Because you've invested in it. It is your property. It is. You want to keep it running. You want to keep it on the road. You want that car to succeed. And we wanted this to succeed. I see. And I think sometimes it's easy to throw in the towel when you don't have much of an investment in it. Uh -huh. And so I'm not talking just about money, um, but I'm talking about our lives. So we invested our lives. And we lived in that tent. And we took cold showers. And we'd, we didn't have refrigeration or nothing. We'd have to go in and buy. We had just a cool box, and we'd have to go in and buy ice and keep the perishable stuff fresh. And the only reason we put up that, that grass fence around it is because the community couldn't believe that they had white people as neighbors. And they would sit there and like, oh, my God, there's this we guy. We need some white yeah. folks. Right? They're our neighbors here. So <laughs> we, <laughs> we couldn't have any privacy. So we put that grass fence up there. And... Uh, but I tell you what, the T.A. Uh, TA Musa Makunda, who boarded us is over here, T.A. Kaunda, uh, and uh, the chiefs, uh, Chief Mpunda, they would all come and we would sit uh -huh. and have Coke and, and, and bread. And, and it was because I lived among them. Yes. And it would have been very easy to just 
find a place to rent area exactly, nine or yeah, something yeah, and drive back and forth. Try and try, but Didn't want said, to do that. I'm going to live there. I'm going to live with, with the you. people, and we're going to build this together. Hundred percent. Did you get the feeling that they they buy in as as a, they, they they bought into the idea and they believed in it? Yeah, because what would happen is is that like the TAs, the chiefs would come, and they would start sending their people to help us mold bricks. Yeah. Uh, you would see sand come in a scotch cart. Yeah. Um, if if we whatever whatever could come from the natural resources around it, they would participate it. in that. Okay. And uh, some would just come and help. Well, I can remember some of the early volunteers. One of our early volunteers, his name was Fudrick, mm -hmm. and he came. Wouldn't didn't demand a salary. Didn't want a salary. Ended up a salary. Went into our hospital. Was sent him to school. He became a pharmacy technician. And he went from volunteering to being full-time in our hospital. <laughs> and these were the people that invested their lives and became committed. He said, I'm going to do this. You don't have to pay me anything. I'm here to tell help me, you get Tell me what up. I have to do. Yes, because this is development for our community. And so many of the people saw that and they wanted it. Now, you've got some that don't see it. Yeah. You know, they just want what they can get from it. Of course. And that's true in any society. And that's how you build a community like this. And that's the kind of uh, people that we want. And this is the guest that we're talking to today on Cruise 5, Jeff Rogers, co-founder of uh, Child Legacy International. There is a clinic uh, that they're running around here that's serving the community and many other things that are feeding into that whole system. And uh, we're also feeding some music here. He has said no dancing, strictly no dancing. He made us play Despachito, such a danceable tune, but couldn't even move a limb. Uh, the next song, what is it going to be? Pentatonics, Hallelujah. Fantastic, yeah. Hallelujah. Been done by many, many artists, but this one, Pentatonics. First class. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Some a cappella music on Cruise 5 today. I can't even count how many things you have in this. Um, I don't even know how big this place is, but just excite me with what is happening here. Oh, wow. Let's start with the community hospital that we have. So there is that. Mm -hmm. And then I saw greenhouses. Yes. Yes. Greenhouse. Wow. We do a lot of agriculture. Yes. Um, so we do have greenhouses where we do a lot of herbs and micro herbs. Um, we do have specific pieces of land set aside where we grow a lot of leafy products. And, and, and we, have to, we grow a lot of this because the room that we're in here, this is our big dining room. Mm -hmm. And attached to this big dining room are some guest rooms. Okay. So in a good year where we don't have a, a virus traveling around, <laughs> this room would probably be full of people um, they could be medical students from um, Amerit. Last year we had 25 medical students from Oklahoma State University. Mm. And all of them were going into obstetrics, studying to become OBGYNs. So they were here for a month working in and with our clinicians and our doctors at our hospital. Um, so we have these rooms where they can come and stay right on site. And then we feed them here and, and internet's here. Everything's kind of complete for them. But um, some of the cool things that that hospital is doing, we have an eye center down there, which, I mean, literally, it's state-of-the-art technology. And we get some of the top cataract surgeons in America that come over here and do eye camps for one, two, three weeks out of every year. And we'll do 70, 80, 90 critical cataract surgeries. Sometimes we do lens replacement for, for trauma care, uh, and we do laser surgery, we do glaucoma. And they'll come, and they'll be here for a week, and we'll do, man, we'll just, just do one surgery after another. And some of the equipment that we have down there, you're only gonna find maybe South Africa, India, or Europe. Mm. And so there are people that don't wanna travel abroad, they'll come out here. And we'll be able to do a lot of that treatment for them here. And then if we have our surgeons here from America, we'll go in and you'll see some real surgery taking place in our operating rooms. And along with that, because I had said earlier, you know, it's one thing to say there's a problem, something yes. else to... So we're doing a research program right now with Duke University there in 
uh, South Carolina. Um, it's a genetic retinal research program because in Malawi, cataract among pediatrics is very, very high. And so cataracts overall is very, very high among Malawians. So our concern was why? And what can we do about it? So we've started this research program, which has now been going on for several months and will probably carry on until we can collectively with Duke University be able to ascertain here's, here's a problem, here's what we can do about it, and this is what we're going to do about it. So we'll be able to say if you were to, you were to come in, a family member come in, maybe your small child come in with, with, with a cataract, um, we're going to say, well, okay, this is notable in Malawi, and this is what we can do to try to help not only you, but Malawians. I see. So we do that research down there, and then we have a very extensive lab down there that we do a, a lot of lab work. Um, we have a relationship with Ohio State University where we do baseline healthcare research and been doing that for several years. Now we've wrapped that up now. And um, so there's a lot of things that, that go on just in the hospital, yes. which really make it unique. And then there's a lot of things that happen around the hospital. Yes. Our fish programs, greenhouses and agriculture, the bamboo, the macadamians. And, uh, and we also try to do a lot of programs with the rural farmers too. Okay. Um, so, you know, so why are you growing macadamians? Uh, it's not just because you want, you want to you know, harvest uh, you know, nuts. Mm -hmm. um, we need to d diversify the way we think. Traditionally, we think that when the rains are going to come, we put a seed in the ground, we wait for the rains, we get a corn stalk, we harvest that, we're done. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're told that Malawi does endure the longest dry season of just about any country on the continent of Africa, but it doesn't mean we can't diversify our crop base. So we try to train in those areas mm -hmm. and show what we can do with, with ground to alleviate seepage and evaporation and how can we create small pond bases because fish is a great protein base and, and then grow these crops that will bring in income, bamboo for instance. With the deforestation in Malawi being so bad and we're harvesting any tree we can to make a bag of charcoal, we need to come up with an alternative to that. And bamboo is one of the greatest alternatives. In three years, you can harvest. Uh, when you turn it into charcoal, it burns hotter and longer than in a hardwood does. So it's going to help us to curve that deforestation. That's going to take a lot of us doing it. Mm -hmm. But we're doing our part. And with 20, over 20,000 plants, we'll be able to start putting or making that charcoal training and teaching on how grow some. I mean, the, the bamboo itself is a timber structure beams, laminated beams. It's stronger than hardwood. So there's, it's a wonderful resource and it's going to play a big role as an alternative source of wood and heat and cooking so that we can slow down the deforestation. So much alternative stuff going around here. Tell me about <laughs> the alternative energy. Uh, it's unbelievable that this whole institution is off the grid. It's not connected to ESCOM. No. You're managing to power everything here from solar and wind? Mm -hmm. That's possible? Oh, 100%. 100, 100 um, so this project has roughly 400 solar panels on site. Um, Do you have like a solar farm or you just put them on, on the roofs? Well, mo a lot of them are on the roof. Okay. And some of them are stationed down where we built our first powerhouse. Okay. And there's really three primary ways of collecting sun rays. And there is a single axis tracking rack. There's a dual axis tracking rack. And then there's fixed panels that you just put right up on a roof. Yes. And so a lot of our buildings have part of their roof facing the north, which in the southern hemisphere, that's where your panels need to face. Okay. So on our project here, you'll find uh, panels on a single axis tracking rack, and that's just a rack that goes east and west. Yes. And then there's a dual axis that goes east and west, and it adjusts for the season change. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the uh, winter months, you know, our sun is more here, summer months, our sun is more there. Yeah. And then there's just the fixed racks on the roof facing the north. So, and the only reason we did that was I wanted to demonstrate the, uh, the different ways of drawing sun rays. And so anybody could look at that and go, well, my gosh, let's fix them. Let's put them on single axis. Let's put them on dual axis, whatever. 
And, um, and then we have our inverters that change the DC to AC mm -hmm. into alternative current. We have our batteries, which stores the power so that when we have a patient in the hospital, we have a woman that's going to be delivering a baby in the middle of the night. And, and I might add, I don't know why it is, but when you do maternity, you're going to find out babies only want to come at night. <laughs> they just, it's like, I'm not ready for that sunshine. Let's come. Let's. So when we deliver a baby, it's usually, it seems to be at nighttime. We have six delivery suites down there. <laughs> and we have all the, the, the baby warmers, the incubators, the oxygen concentrators. We have all that down there so that we're able to offer that the same care for that little newborn baby as you would get in any institution around the country. Before we can take that baby and give it back to the mother, we make sure that we've done every single thing that we need to do, that it's 100% stable and ready to be wrapped up and given back to the mother. And we do all of that with alternative energy. So it's possible and it's happening right here. Maybe could grab a few tips about how to do that. I mean, uh, it's, uh, we've been talking about this for quite a long time. I mean, people get, getting people off the grid, but it doesn't mm. look like uh, the, the, there are many people who want to pioneer that. And, and, and it's good that you, you took the, the, the step to do that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely fantastic institution running absolutely on no ESCOM electricity at all. And it's, it's all alternative energy. And let's go to some alternative uh, songs now uh, as, as we continue with Cruise 5 today. I'm talking to uh, Jeff Rogers. He is the co-founder of Child Legacy International. What's our fourth song going to be? Celine Dion. Celine I Surrender. Yes, I Surrender. Great song. I Surrender. Fantastic song by Celine Dion. That's our fourth song in Cruise 5 today. Welcome back to Cruise 5. Today we're here at Child Legacy Community Hospital, but as it turns out, it's more than just a community hospital. This is under the Child Legacy International. The co-founder is Jeff Rogers and he's our guest today. This place is found right here at Nsundwe. And it is an, a very, very fantastic place. I'm sure you can see some of the places that we've been able to capture uh, through this program. And uh, I, I take it the community uh, benefits from this. Do, so do they have to pay something or it's... Um... Yeah, yes. Um, number one, the community really does benefit. I yes. mean, we employ a lot of people from the community, well yes. over 100 people here. Mm -hmm. That's not including the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, most of your technical staff will come from everywhere. Okay. But with all the other work that we do here, we employ right from the community. And so employment's a big thing. And so employing over 100 people is a big benefit for our, our community here. And with the hospital, of course, there's a filing fee. And it's just uh, 2,500 kwacha. Mm -hmm. And then that filing fee just goes right back into the hospital, of course. And now that doesn't run our hospital. Mm -hmm. But um, what it does do is it helps us to manage our flow of patient care because um, we, you don't want them just constantly coming back for no reason. And they do have their health passport and we have some of the best clinicians here at this, at this facility. So um, they, do, they do pay a small 2,500 kwacha filing mm -hmm. fee. Mm -hmm. um, if, it's the same, if it's the same ailment, they don't pay again. Okay. But if they come back, you know, they got malaria one time and they have a, a respiratory infection the next time. Huh. It, that's, but maternity, the, there's no charge on maternity right now uh, that we have with, with that. And we deliver, man, we have delivered over 6,700 babies here. Wow. And uh, we've provided over 1,000 C-sections here. And on average, we were delivering um, over 200 a month. And, uh, and that is a service we have just been providing for the community. And uh, that's the size of quite a, a, a large hospital in Malawi. Yes. And when you look at the budget, you realize it's a very large hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and there is the school as well. You did say something about that. Well, there's the Makanga Primary School over uh -huh. here. Um, it's a very big school. They, they're between eight and 900 little primary kids there. And they only had three classrooms. Uh -huh. So a year ago, we started uh, building more classrooms. And last year, we put up over six classrooms with a library and an administrative room. And, um, but 
this year we weren't able to contribute, but then the school hasn't even been open this year so far. Mm -hmm. So, but we'll continue because with 900 kids, you know, we roughly need 26, 27 classrooms over there and, and some staff. So we're committed to also helping. And that, that school actually borders our property. Mm -hmm. So we also had a feeding program there, a uh, protein-based meal that we were taking in. And we're also working with them on agricultural programs there. And that's just part of what we want to do to help them at a young age. Uh, running an institution of this size and helping so many people from the community, you get into the trap of having the community over depend mm -hmm. on, the, on, on the institution. How are you working on making sure that you win these people off so that they can also yeah. survive on their own? Well, um, we're, we're making a lot of adjustments just in our health care program with yes. that because it is easy. Um, you know, the word goes out, oh, go here and, and deliver a baby for free. <laughs> yeah. They'll come from everywhere. Exactly. For that. And, and not just because it's free, but because it is quality care. That exactly. We offer. And uh, same with our uh, performing obstetrics. And so the, we are making adjustments in that, and that there'll probably be fees that will probably come into that maternal care. Mm -hmm. Again, we, they, they have to be invested into it as well. It's their baby. It's their lives. Mm -hmm. um, for the community, because um, we're very involved with the community, mm -hmm. and we don't want them to see us as just a, a borrowing institution. Mm -hmm. So when, we, when that happens, we try to put programs in place where they will come and be a part of what we're doing, and they just earn an income with everybody else. And most people's, a lot of the needs that they have can be solved with resources. Mm -hmm. they, they need flour and they wanted a, a small child back in school, a number of different things. So, it, but we don't want to just loan. Yeah. We want them to be able to work for what they need to do. Now, I mean, we have I don't know, about 20 women that work here. Mm -hmm. They're the best workers I have. And, uh, and they, they make a paycheck. And I know that when I pay those women, that money goes into clothes, shoes for the kids, food, on and on and on. Yes. And uh, they're not necessarily skilled in anything, probably not overeducated in anything, but their willingness to work is outstanding. And that you can do anything that mm -hmm. you need to do. Mm -hmm. So most people in this area know, they know, if you come here, it, you, it's going to cost you something as well, mm -hmm. but you're going to leave with something as Good. well. Tell me about the support that you get from the government of Malawi. I mean, setting up something like this constantly you need, or maybe even all the time, mm -hmm. you need support from the government, because uh, obviously you are, you're helping a lot of Malawians here, and um, you're doing the job that probably government would have to be doing. Uh, how is the collaboration with the government of Malawi? It's gotten a lot better. <laughs> it, it was not that good. Did I say that? <laughs> I think you've gone through harder times. <laughs> so, in a, your first statement, yes. that we have done something here that, you know, government hadn't done. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. This was not done for me. Mm -hmm. This is not something I'm going to uproot and take with me somewhere else. Yeah. It's here and it's here to stay. Yes. Um, everybody knows I'm not necessarily going to be here forever, but this will be here forever. Yeah. There has been a substantial investment that has been made into this project. When you have this much square feet under roof, this much alternative energy, the standard and quality of everything that you see here, that all takes resources to do, to offer that kind of quality of health care, to have the, on the shelf the drugs you need when you need it, the consumables when you need it, that's expensive. It is. When you have right at 100 technical staff, that's expensive. They demand a different salary than the young woman that might just be working in the dining room here. Huge expense. Mm -hmm. We've had an MOU with government for the last eight years, and, but that MOU has really not been honored up until now. And uh, the Minister of Health came out here uh, a few weeks ago. And matter of fact, we were battling to even get our last MOU signed because every couple of years you gotta renew it. And we had gone, golly, 18, 20 months, and we couldn't get the, the last one signed. And um, when she came out here, 
she had the MOU with her, and she was ready to do business. And, uh, and an MOU is good, because it shows a verbal collaboration. Okay. It may not be an active collaboration, yes. but you've got this verbal one going it's on. A commitment. But with something like this, I need more than words. I need action. So we were trying to get a government um, service level agreement with government. And um, this, this is a tough thing to achieve because government has got to put this into their budget and they're going to come in and they're going to pay us back for the services that we provide, a percentage of that service. And we couldn't get that accomplished until just a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. And we're now at a place where the service level agreement has been written up and put in place and signatures are now starting to go on to the last page so that this can be implemented, we're hoping and praying this year. That will help offset a percentage of our operation cost. Um, we still need more of a commitment. Um, we're at this point in time, as we sit here, you and I, we're trying to be approved and certified with CHAM so that they can help with part of that operation. Anything that has proven itself over a period of time, successfully, is worth one's investment. Uh -huh. And why recreate it or why let it die if together we can make it succeed? Uh -huh. And we've always wanted to have that collaboration with government, but we just couldn't seem to get it to ever come together. Not for lack of trying on our part. Uh -huh. Now, it looks like we're starting to break through some big ice. Uh -huh. and. And it, and it will take, we're not, we're not there yet. Yes. But honestly speaking, yep. and I think I'll be speaking for a lot of NGOs in the country of Malawi and any country in Africa, donor fatigue is a, is a big thing right now, and especially in America. Yep. Donors are fatigued. Now, the economy is not good right now. Yes. The stock market is terrible. The price of oil is not that good. Natural gas is tanked. Yeah. So... People with investments, with discretionary funds, they're not just writing checks like they used to. No. And quite frankly, most people who can write a check like that, they want somebody they can trust. Somebody that they know is going to do what they said they're going to do. Yes. If I woke up tomorrow and said, I think I'm going to start a nonprofit organization, um, I better go on to Prozac, but I probably wouldn't even do it. <laughs> Simply because the donor base now isn't anything like it was 30 years ago when I started doing this. Mm -hmm. It's different now. A lot of what you see here is because donors can trust me. Yes. And they know if Jeff says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. do it. That's why you see alternative energy, the standard of buildings, the equipment, a hospital, the standard of that hospital. All of that is in place because donors say, he's not, he's not going to cheat us. Mm -hmm. I don't have any... Uh, any hidden accounts. Yeah. I have a salary just like you have a salary. Yeah. All of this is because people trust that we're going to do what we're going to do. But there is a fatigue out there that's tough right now. Mm -hmm. And with the pandemic, it's even tougher. Mm -hmm. I would say that Child Legacy, we, we had lost a large percentage of our donor base, especially for operations. Development, well, we just, we're not, we haven't done a lot of development in, a, in the last couple years. Mm -hmm. Some most of what we've been doing has just been repairs and maintenance and just running and getting by. Okay. Now, if government keeps its word and it comes in alongside us, an institution, a hospital like this, will continue with its doors open and providing some of the best maternal. When you've delivered just under 7,000 babies with one maternal loss, you have done your job and you've done it well. Mm -hmm. And we've done that. So we're worth investing into. And I think government now see, they see, yeah. I don't want us to get political, but uh, Nsundwe has gotten <laughs> some very bad publicity, especially uh, in the run up to the uh, mm -hmm. June 23, 2020 elections. Did that affect you or hurt you in any way? <laughs> uh, everything about Nsundwe seemed to start sounding a bit... Uh... This, this was a tough neighborhood for a while. <laughs> yes, yes. It, 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 what it good really can was. come out of that community? <laughs> we yes. heard that a lot. <laughs> 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 oh, 
I remember flying in one time, or early this year when I, I flew in early this year and I was getting my passport stamped at Immigrations and they didn't see my resident permit. And they just said, oh, where are you going? I said, Masundwe, Masundwe. <laughs> Well, you're going to Missoula. Exactly. Going to I said, "Well, I live there." Oh no, you no, don't no, no, We know you don't live in Missoula. Um, but believe me, it had its challenges yes. this year, mm -hmm. um, or leading up to the elections. Yep. Absolutely, um, we weren't exempt from some of that nonsense mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, demonstrating, and um, a lot of people coming through are outpatient as a result of the nonsense. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it was challenging, and, and I'll be honest with you. There was there was a time when I thought, well, I don't know if we're going to survive this. Yes, I mean the economy, yeah. politics, yeah. Um, social media. I mean, just so many things going wrong. Yeah, and um, but we're here. Good, we did survive that, and um, I, almost anybody you talk to now that's here will tell you that it feels better now. Mm -hmm. uh, we feel like there's hope. Yeah. That this isn't just all on our shoulders now, but there's going to be a shared collaboration. And, uh, and, and you can drive through Masundwe peacefully now. There were some times when you might want to slow down when you go <laughs> well, through Well, I can there. assure you it was, it, was, it was quite a pleasant drive coming here. Good. Uh, and it's, it's a peaceful community now, and I think people have gotten back to their uh, daily work. And uh, that's what I want to leave you to yes. now, to, to get back to your daily work. Yeah. And we have to wind up this program. Uh, as we wind up, a couple of questions that I've, uh, I've got, uh, to which you can only answer yes or no. Oh, okay. Yes. But first, you have to tell me your full name. What's your full name? Okay, so it's Jeffrey... Rogers. Jeffrey Rogers, do you have any tattoos? No, no, I got nothing. No, I'm <laughs> do you have any piercings? No, sir. Do you have children? I have two sons. Have you ever shot a gun? I have. Have you cried over someone? Oh, absolutely. I ha have you fallen in love before? Yes. Have you, <laughs> have you killed a chicken before? Uh, maybe on the road. <laughs> maybe on the road. Have you gotten into a fight before? Not really, no. Have you gotten any surgeries? I have had some. Have you ever been hospitalized? Yes, sir. Have you donated blood? Yes, sir. Have you ever smoked weed? Uh, no. No. Well, now you, who, who's watching this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I get my answer from that. Am I going to be arrested when this show's over? <laughs> You're perfectly safe. Uh, have you ever drunk alcohol? Yes. Do you drink alcohol? Yes. Have you broken someone's heart? Probably. Probably. Yes. Have you had a crush on someone? Oh, yes. I guess we ended there. <laughs> Mercy. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Jeff. And um, there is a particular song that you want us to play mm. as our last song in this program. Yeah. And that song is fantastic and inspirational. Tell us more about it. Yeah. Well, it's called Life on the Line. Life on the Line. Yeah. And it was a song that was actually written for a movie that came out a year or so ago with John Travolta. And it was called, it was about the linemen. And these were the men that would stretch the utility lines uh, across America. This movie took place in the state of Texas. And it was, um, it was about their lives and the risk that they took. And it was about a family and uh, about the men that had given their life yes. by, so that you and I could have electricity. Yes. And so um, this movie came out, it was a great movie. And this song was actually written and composed for that movie. And, and I think that's what you're doing. You're putting your life on the line. Well, yeah, it feels that way a lot. Thank you. Jeff Rogers, our guest today on Cruise 5, ending on that note, life on the line. Until next time, it's goodbye. It's coming in off the golf.